Jordan Peterson hosting Russell Brand on his podcast primarily to talk about Russell Brand's newfound Christianity. He's converted and adopted Christ. He's been baptized. And that's fine. That's fine. You know, convert to whatever religion you like. But it being Jordan Peterson and Russell Brand, of course, they must dramatically over-intellectualize and also make this into indulgent guru by monologuing at each other. Just to give a taste. Has there been a significant reversal of charge? And what is that charge? What? How do? How are we endowed with that charge now? At the point when you have Richard Dawkins saying, I am culturally Christian, well, are, well, are people starting to recognize that there is, um, like, that this is not just a remnant ideology this is a living thing that has been discarded i listened to that bishop baron who you had on your show the other day talking about ethereal angels and i thought yes the religion that i am interested in is not a precursor uh, and uh, a parallel to psychotherapy it is a precursor and parallel to quantum physics helping me to understand what do you mean when you say self who is the this self what do you mean when you say reality when you say reality what are you talking about and is it possible that reality is something that we conjure here as vessels and conduits of the divine if we have the capacity to somehow in the moment through practice disavow the strong gravitational literally pull of the material and the unconscious ethos with with, with which we are continually inculcated by the insidious, nihilistic, or, 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 or albeit glistening culture that attempts to uh, 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 make us all devotees of this new banality. So Russell Brand has become interested in Christianity. Huberman also has expressed an interest. I mean, it's hard not to be just a tiny bit cynical. About the timing. About the timing. <laughs> They've both had these sexual misconduct allegations against them and they find jesus shortly afterwards but there has been a jesus wide turn of of a lot of opinionators nominally secular gurus russell brand is putting his particular Mm. lyrical spin on it of course loquacious loquacious Mm. stamp and then like the thing that gets me with all of this is you know they can't just have found something that they like that that gels with them it has to be that the world has failed to properly appreciate or like, you know, the universe is now humming along to appreciate the true wisdom of Christianity, which was there. And like, it's a precursor to quantum physics. So it, it can never be right that just this appeals to them because of particular circumstances that they have and particular proclivities they have. It is more, this is the key to unlocking the true meaning of the universe. And it just so happens that it corresponds with all of the things that they were already talking about and interested in. Yeah. I mean, do you really believe it? Like, do you think Russell Brand has really developed a a genuine interest in Christianity? Or is this this stuff that he's saying now is part of a new line of rhetoric? Yeah, I mean, it, it is. But I think it's just... Essentially, Russell Brand always talks exactly like this about every topic that he talks about. And he's now relying on like a particular kind of vocabulary more, the kind of traditional Christian vocabulary. But you can hear him weaving in all of the usual stuff that he that he does, right? He has these enthusiasms, right? One of his earlier enthusiasms was towards like socialist revolution. And then oh, yeah, he had an enthusiasm yeah. for like battling addiction through spiritual awakening. And now he has a enthusiasm for this version of Christianity, supposedly. But yeah, I, I know what you mean. It's just like a different, hey, this is the new the new reinvented Russell brand with this new, you know, line yeah. of Blather. I referred to this, I think, on, on Twitter as like the apophysis of indulgent religious monologuing, right? And part of the reason is, so his other person that he's conversing with is Jordan Peterson. So here's Jordan Peterson belaboring a point at length, as he often does. And this is just the start of him 
outline a conceptual framework, Matt. But so see if you can follow the thread of what he's arguing here. So let me lay out the idea and you tell me what you think about it. So what these models do is map the statistical relationship between, between you might say, markers. And so imagine that you can tell the difference between a, a word like, imagine a word B-I-N-T, which isn't a word, but it's kind of a plausible non-word. And it's a plausible non-word because the statistical relationship between the letters mimics uh, the likely statistical relationship between letters in a real English word. So it's much more of a word than Q-N-Z-T. Okay, so now there are statistical regularities between letters that enable us to identify words. And then there are statistical regularities between words in phrases that make sense. And then there are statistical regularities between phrases in sentences and sentences in relationship to one another, and then say within paragraphs, and then paragraphs in relationship to, to one another. And the large language models are trained to map all that. <clears throat> so what, what that implies obviously is something like any given idea is statistically likely to exist in relationship to a certain set of other ideas and not and not distal ideas. And so if I throw an idea at you, I'm also throwing a network of associated co-ideas at you at the same time. And then out farther in the penumbra are even more distantly associated ideas. And more creative people are going to be able to leap from the center to the distal ideas. We already know that from studying creativity. Okay, let's give you a break there. So okay. could you Got process that high-level idea about semantic networks? That's yep. Did yep. it require <laughs> that, that <laughs> level of letters and words mm-hmm. and, and words mm-hmm. and phrases mm-hmm. and phrases and set and, set, and like he, Oh, um, so there are certain words that, and actually, the funny thing is the example he gave B I N T, bint. Do you, do you know bint is a word? It's a slang word in English. It means like a derogatory term for like a girl or woman, right? A bint. So, yes, yes. I'm surprised right. Russell think- Brand didn't pull him up on that. You know, this known word B I N T, which means nothing. <laughs> and like, yeah, it does mean something. But so that was the start, Matt. So you've got that. Things exist in semantic networks. And you can hear it's like kind of riffing yep. on LLM. Yep. So a little bit more, the next stage of this. So the large language models map the statistical association between sets of ideas. That's a good way of thinking about it. You can imagine the same thing happens with images. So if you bring to mind the image of a witch, you're much more likely to bring to mind the image of a cauldron and a black cat, for example, and maybe a spider, maybe a pumpkin. So, So the collective unconscious would be, take a given culture, the collective unconscious would be the statistical association between ideas insofar as that culture has represented the ideas. And that's mappable mathematically. And so a symbol would be something like a set of, it's a set of statistically associated concepts, right? Especially image, image laden concepts in particular with regards to symbol. So it's a weight what the collective unconscious seems to be is the, the system of weights between concepts through which we see the world. So, and that makes it a real thing. It makes symbols real because a symbol is a network of ideas with a core idea at the center. So, yeah, he took a leap there, didn't he? By the way, for people, you know, up to a certain point, none of this is objectionable or interesting, frankly, <laughs> that that words and visual features uh, tend to be correlated with one another. It's semiotics in in a way. Like he's just yeah, restating yeah. semiotics, but really slowly, <laughs> really slowly. But he took a jump there, Chris, when he, when he went to the collective unconscious. Like the symbols are real, like follow the logic. Well, there, he, right? he also took that jump to say like symbols are real. Now, if you asked him if Jesus was real, he would say, well... 
it depends what you mean by real. But right, he has no problem saying like symbols are real. And of course, symbols are real. Like because the, the freaking there, right? Yeah. Like you, a but, flag is a symbol. But anyway, I'm just, just saying he would take issue with any declarative statement made, but he doesn't mind saying it when he says it, right? Symbols mm-hmm. are real, which I think everybody would agree yeah. with and but he means he means they're real because they're embedded in a network semantic of network. semiotic associations i know so he wants to mean the in the, the kind of abstract concept is real because it has a statistic regularity in the way that it's understood yeah. and mapped in a given cultural yeah. which, co- it's so it's so much which, it sounds profound but it's like saying like the word dog is real right because it's associated with leashes yeah and dog food and and stuff like that and that has meaning to everyone and it's like you know yes but and if you say the word dog dog food comes to mind and fur comes to mind and isn't that shocking like yeah i guess it's, yeah, not it's, a like, it's, it's a power of symbols <laughs> like, over your mind chris yeah yeah so but like so he's wanting to say that like llms have kind of peeled back the curtain and revealed that statistical relationships between words can be mapped and things can be predicted and we there is like a you know a, a deep reality to concepts and metaphors which is all linked into his stuff with maps of meaning now i'm just the main thing i want to make here is like it takes him so long to be labor you know fairly straightforward mm. concept but there's not even accurate you know what i mean like like he he has the most shallow understanding of llms you can tell by the way he talks about them and for instance that aspect about like embedding a word into like a point in that semantic space that doesn't even happen in the deep learning part of it that's done through a pre-processing step which is basic matrix algebra which yes he's right it's all about correlations and stuff but that's why you can do things in that space like you can say take the word king or the concept of king it, it, it gets mapped to that space. You could subtract man from yeah. that and, you, and you'll literally get queen, right? It's all very cool. It's very interesting, you know, but based on statistical associations, you can place words into a kind of a concept space. It's great. But that's not LLMs is my point, right? That's a quite a simple bit of matrix algebra that, that can detect those correlations or matrix algebra (laughs) (laughs) matrix i'll never change i'll never change you didn't correct it you didn't correct it there but that's fine (laughs) so i agree that he's he has a shallow understanding of llms he has perhaps a deeper interest in semiotics and you know like interpretivism jungian symbolism all that stuff we all know he loves this right so yeah. this was just as i to introduce you to this is you know him looks like you know layering up the build up i think russell brand responds to this and adds in another thing that we should consider alongside these you know uh like statistical associations between words yes how beautiful firstly i wonder uh, with uh, some of the areas we might uh uh, at least it seems to me that uh, I ought address as occurring are um, the difference between signifiers that are, of course, according to post-structuralist and to much of the work done by it within semiotics, arbitrary and potentially universal, natural, or at least practical symbols. Uh, I, I wonder for example about the idea that is it a type of language that a barn full of chicks will respond to the silhouette of a bird when it travels above their heads on a wire in one direction because when traveling from north to south the silhouette resembles that of a hawk but when it travels back along the same trajectory but in reverse they do not respond because it no longer resembles the silhouette of a hawk a hawk does not travel in that formation that is a type of language there is language within nature this is the first thought so you're referring to something yeah okay so so that adds an addif- a, additional dimension to the to the model so then you might say that there are co-occurring patterns of regularity with biological significance that exist in some exist in some real sense outside the merely conceptual and those are probably marked in the fundamental analysis by death. What? Death? 
<laughs> yeah. What did? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's there is more that comes up there. But it, well, so what he wants to say is like because the hawk is a predator, and the response to the silhouette, it like you know it, it, the kind of thing about humans respond to hearing a sound in the bush because it might be a predator, right? So mm. the evolution. Mm makes death like a more this is like the most shallow and also obscure version of what kevin mitchell talked about very cogently and wrote about you know agency and evolution and the biology of how that stuff works like this is like that but just a really bad version of it right not only that matt but do you know the experiment that russell brand is talking about no no, i don't understand why a hawk would not trigger the yeah so i looked it up and he's, he's retelling something, but he's got it wrong, right? Like, so he's saying it's because north to south versus south to north wouldn't trigger the response, right? Which, like, it doesn't, that doesn't seem sensible because the, no. a hawk ship, surely they could turn, right? And the yeah. actual experiment is called the hawk goose effect. And it's basically like the silhouette in one direction resembles a hawk because the wings are up closer. And then there's a long tail. But if you do it the other way, it's like a goose. The silhouette goes backwards. Yeah, it's a goose. Yeah, so they don't respond. And they were were showing that like birds respond to this silhouette without instruction uh, in some species, right? Like it's a biologically inbuilt behavior. And but that's different, right? So like so he gets the example wrong and and then he he wants to introduce that as like another form of life. It's like adding on to Jordan's theorizing, right? This is adding another level, the the like the visual uh, evolutionary level. And then Jordan is like, that's interesting. Yes, we do need to. And this encapsulates the notion of death. So now we've got, you know, silhouette language added and, and now like the imagery of death. And this continues on. Like, essentially, we've talked about it before, but it gives the impression, you know, that there's a theory that being developed and, like, this is great minds, like, kind of adding different yeah. components to what it's, it's really waffling and just riffing on research half-remembered and, and big ideas. I mean, I can yeah. understand why people get into it because it has the appearance of profundity and depth. It, it is the guru effect, right? It, yeah. Everything that's been said is referencing complex ideas and, and research and stuff, but it's fundamentally yeah. either straightforward or or not like not as profound, at least as it's being presented. Yeah, and no, I get what you're saying. They're kind of going through a pantomime of two people that are so brilliant that they're actually developing a whole new theory of, of language, the unconscious, society, symbols, animals, death, Jungianism, you know, they're they're creating this grand theory on the fly live in this podcast, except of course, they're not. As you said, they're reprising some half-remembered, poorly expressed ideas that have just been around since forever and have been set out much more clearly by other people. And then just randomly throwing in a thing like, well, there you go. So the hawk might eat the chickens and they're sensitive to that. So now we need Jung and the archetype of death, right? And then it'll go off on that. And so it's a very bad theory to call it that, that they're developing. But, you know, it's a pandemine, you know? I, I can see how it gives you the feeling of, of getting somewhere. Yeah, so my, you asked, you know, about death. And I, I mentioned that Jordan had said that symbols are real. But just to highlight, you know, how this connects to Geller and maybe he was too quick to talk about things being real. Because the other one of the other things I've been thinking about is that people ask me questions like, you know, do you think God is real? And a question like that always begs the question for me is like, well, what the hell do you mean real? Like what makes something real? And, you know, you could say tangibility, um, although that's only one dimension of what makes something real. It's like I think what makes things real in the final analysis is probably death. And in the, in the example you used of the silhouette, which is a very famous example with regard to birds, the silhouette traveling in one direction, that signifies death reliably, right, over a very long span of evolutionary history. And any creature that didn't respond to that silhouette was at a much, more, at a much higher probability of being picked off. So then one of the things you might note, and this is where the postmodernists got things like dreadfully wrong and where the large language models have drifted into insanity. 
So imagine that there's a statistical relationship between concepts that's, okay, so then you might say, well, what gives that statistical relationship reality? And the postmodern types would say, well, it's just arbitrary cultural construction. But it's not because there are patterns of relationships between events that are part and parcel of the world per se. And some of those need to be accurately mapped by the conceptual system or you die. And so I would say the, like the, the ideas that ring most true to us, that grip us in this sort of archetypal way are ideas that bear directly on our survival, whether we recognize it or not. They strike a chord within us. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, fair enough. That's fine. I mean, I, I think everyone agrees, don't they, Chris? That, you know, any kind of signaling or a language symbolic system, it's it, if it's not grounded in, in reality somewhere, like that's it's pretty basic sort of AI. Well, yeah, like the notion that things are not completely entirely arbitrary about the concepts that people construct in the world they are tied to material it's, reality like of yeah, course it's not of course that's the case yeah. <laughs> yeah because because if it wasn't you would have no way of mapping concepts that are useful in the actual world but he wants to say there matt is that like one i, I just want to highlight that there he's suddenly concerned about what real means he wasn't when he used it earlier, but like here, you know, yeah, if it yeah. comes to God, but it's very important. If, if you ask him about God, then suddenly, yeah, I know. And so, yeah, I don't know. Tables are only real to us in the sense that they help prevent <laughs> me from dying because my coffee is sitting on it. And if I don't drink that coffee, it's going to feel like I'm dying. So, I mean, there's a really boring way in which that's all true, right? In that, like, things, things that are relevant or significant to us are, are, are often because of it has some functional relevance to us, right? It does. I mean, like, it's obvious that there are lots of things that relate to, you know, survival or that kind of thing, which will be more relevant. But but also, Jordan has this habit of, you know, like, really stretching things and extend... Like, remember, he had this metaphor where he took a glass and he was like, the reason you can pick out a, a, a glass is because it can contain water and you need water... So, and you're like, that's not like the correct explanation, but like he's pointing at something that, you know, object mapping and whatnot is, you know, you can tie it all the basic processes. But the fact that like a container can be filled with water is not the reason that you can distinguish, you know, like yeah. an object uh, on the table. But it's not completely wrong either. And I'll, I've got another example to illustrate this. But so he's mm. basically been saying death is everything, right? And if if we go back... He was talking about how, you know, the the kind of interconnection of words is is everything. And Russell said, maybe, you know, the ability to perceive visual yeah, uh, cues mm. is everything. And uh, here's another thing that's, that's everything. And one of the striking meta themes of the biblical library is the necessity of sacrifice, right? And so I've been trying to understand, first of all, what it, what it means to sacrifice. It, it means to give up something that's desirable for something that's more desirable. It's something like that. It's, it's something higher. And it's higher because it's, it, it's, it extends over a long, longer period of time and it includes more people. And so, like, sacrifice is the basis of community. Well, why? Well, it's obvious, Russell, as far as I can tell. It's like if you're in a communal relationship, which is any relationship, obviously, then you're giving something up that's immediate to you to establish and maintain the relationship, right? So it's a sacrificial gesture. And once you understand that, once you understand that sacrifice is at the basis of community, the question immediately arises, which is, well, what's the most effective form of sacrifice? And the, the this biblical story, Old and New Testament together, is actually an examination of sacrifice per se. It's an attempt to spiral down to the core of what constitutes, well, you might say the sacrifice that's maximally effective, maximally acceptable to God, 
but it, it's something like what sacrifices by necessity at the core of community. I also don't think there's any difference between that and cortical maturation, by the way. Oh, God, it's so much work to follow along, but I kind of did, right? So, Chris, what do you think? I mean, so at first he kind of references giving up things over time, right? So, you know, the, a classic example is the little, you know, the delayed gratification cookie experiments they did with kids, right? Can you sacrifice mm-hmm. the cookie now? in exchange for the uh, more cookies later on. You know, I guess you can extend that idea of kind of giving up uh, an immediate kind of reward in favor of some sort of less tangible, more abstract reward. And you could, you know, pro-sociality and not altruism, but, you know, basically cultivating good relationships with other people might cost you something in the short short term, but you get reputational enhancement so you're going to get a long-term benefit and you know i guess i guess he's kind of right in the sense that it is got to do with cortical maturation in the sense that there is a thing called like impulsive sensation seeking where you know as you get older and you know you are better at foregoing immediate gratification so but why not why not grind that like if you're going to say well that's fundamentally the core of that the key the understanding everything is sacrifice right sacrifice can't you just equally say it's reciprocity or it's yeah. cooperation yeah. or yeah. It's cooperation, like there's reciprocity any- or, or delayed gratification, right? You don't need to resort to a biblical term, but I, or empathy. Yeah. I guess, you I guess if Jordan were here, he'd say that the Bible encodes like science is rediscovering these terms, right? Which, which you just listed off, but the Bible encodes a deep truth there about delayed gratification and reciprocity and it's all there in the Bible stories about sacrifice. All right, but Matt, just again, just to point something out, like Jordan always makes this thing about how the Bible is the absolute pinnacle of stories of sacrifice, right? Like the Bible story is one where God sacrifices his own son to save humanity, right? You know, the Jesus, the the resurrection and all that. But like the Buddha in Buddhism, there's these things called the Jataka tales, right? Which tell the life of the Buddha before he became the Buddha because of the system of reincarnation, right? And they're talking about his previous lives and what he did. And most of them involve sacrifice uh, on a grand scale. Like just for example, there was one where he was Prince Mahasattva and there was a hungry tiger, tigress that was going to eat its children because it was starving. So Prince Mahasattva gets left alone and decides to try and offer himself to the tiger. The tiger won't eat him initially. So he goes to the edge of a cliff, cuts his neck open and throws himself off the ledge. So he lands in front of the tiger, like all bloodied and stuff. And then the tiger eats him, right? That's a pretty significant <laughs> sacrifice. Uh, and it's in a completely, and like Jordan would say, yes, you know, those, 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 that's the kind of thing. But like, he always focuses on the Christian narrative and jesus i'm just saying there are many Mm. many narratives about sacrifice or about you know being kind to neighbors or whatever in all the traditions and jordan shows like generally not very much interest in them it's it's christianity well likewise themes of sacrifice you know feature in a lot of hollywood films and a lot of ripping yarns generally and i guess he would say that the bible is the wellspring for all of that popular culture all of that literary culture so why is the Bible <laughs> the wellspring when it comes, you know, like after <laughs> various things or in completely different cultural contexts? Like it's not like the Jataka stories are based on the Old Testament, right? They're no. they're not. So it almost suggests that, you know, yeah. Jordan's claims that all literature comes from the Bible is overstated. I agree. I agree. He's obviously starting from the point of the significant things in the Bible and then working forwards from from there and and if you take a broad enough point of view that people respond to stories of sacrifice or that there is a genuine sort of cognitive like pro-social kind of longer term thinking kind of developmental thing that that tends to occur in human psychology and you know you can forge links between that and the pro-sociality that christianity encourages but yeah it's just it's just centering the bible and christianity at the nexus of a whole bunch of random disparate ideas so i mean the, the thing where i always land with jordan is that if you really concentrate hard you could you could you could go through all the obscurantism and you could find the reasonable version interpretation yeah interpretation of what he's saying but 
it's just a, it's a very poor explanation of that it completely ignores all of the stuff that is known in science and academia and everything basically um and presents it as though he's figuring it all out off the cuff and then he links it to jungianism or to the bible and you get well kind of, so he wow deep yeah kind of what you mean is like not that he ignores because he does reference all these like you know big thinkers and whatnot that exist but his presentation is very much like here's the idea i've had which is putting these concepts together in a, a novel and unique way and like jordan's examples almost always the logic you can be charitable and kind of you know extend it to a reasonable version but there are often examples given that are contradictory or where there's inconsistencies right like i remember the time he was talking about the fact that people want to see religious iconography in museums shows that there's something deep and fundamental to it but like the fact that people want to see the lobster phone in museums or modern art does that suggest that there no he doesn't extend that logic so and so we've heard jordan peterson right and i check by the way matt the way that people normally interact in podcast land things are different because people do talk for blocks and then pass over to the next person or whatever but like in any case talking in eight minute blocks is very unusual (laughs) right it's extremely that's a long time to talk without another person speaking and Jordan and, and Bran talk in that kind of way. Eight minutes, six minutes, 30, six minutes, 55 response, seven minutes. So they're just kind of exchanging soliloquies at each other. And they, they make reference to each other's ideas, but it's, it's very much you get the impression that they're just like waiting. OK, this guy has now presented something, so let me go on my riff. And this was Jordan's like riff, right? Here's Bran's. And now... This is two minutes, Matt, so it's, I, I'm sorry for that. But I, I feel you have to hear it in a long stretch to get, you know, the kind of flow of what Russell is like and how his reasoning works. And you'll hear also the standard, like, Guru Priya's shit going on. So listen to this. Good God. Now, there's a lot of Jordan Peterson 101. There's a lot of hits running simultaneously here, JP, because we've already touched on the idea of chaos and the necessary inevitable emergence of patterns within chaos. And it seems that you are positing to a degree that this chaos is analogous to perhaps the collective unconscious and some of the patterns that are emerging in AI models, even with the biases evident within them, are an indicator of how how these patterns emerge within a container and i suppose to say a container is to indicate that we're acknowledging an absolute we've moved from this idea of a collective unconscious and um, um, uh, and patterns emerging within chaos into sacrifice which is obviously another great jordan peterson theme and as you say perhaps the overarching theme of the Bible. My contribution to this incredible amount of information that you are relaying, it has to do with where might one's intention carry you in so much as it seems that in this process of maturation and uh, and one, and a personal relationship with sacrifice how that develops and evolves it seems to me is when one starts to acknowledge that there is not when you use the phrase immediately beneficial that when we're referring to immediacy we are talking about both spatial and temporal immediacy and we might have to consider that when dealing with the sublime as surely the Bible is, that even these categories are called into question, the most basic and taken for granted categories of any temporal creature will have to be challenged. This perhaps helps me to understand how the ultimate sacrifice as rendered in the New Testament and and, and, and most I suppose would regard as the defining Christian image, the, the image of sacrifice, can tackle the complex idea of the pact that is made by the sacrifice of the man god it goes on you cut it thank you you know one you got to hear it you, the, like i said the guru dynamics of jordan you know you've dropped incredible let me yeah. uh, let me add like my it's the same when he engages with brett weinstein right where they're just like constantly saying okay but what you know the temporal have we considered the temporal and the spatial 
don't those concepts might not apply in the same way when we consider the sublime as an aspect of the divine mm. and the, you know the the incarnation of the the nature of man in the bible which surely it's just like yeah. oh god yeah. i understand there are people that really enjoy this and and to some extent it is you know like maybe theologians would take this as insulting but i i think there is an aspect where this reflects what i often feel like listening to people have theological debates mm. where they are sure that they're communicating very deep, sublime, important things. And to me, it just feels a lot like indulgent waffle. Yeah. Cause like the basic thing he's saying is what you just, what Jordan already said and what you summarized Matt, which was as you get older, you become more mature, less egocentric, theoretically as mm. things mature, you're better at like the land gratification and maybe the Bible has things to say about this. That's <laughs> yeah, just like heaps and heaps of other cultural artifacts and stories. And um, yeah, and, and completely been... non religious morals yeah. also suggest yeah. not being, yeah. you know, there's nothing like selfless, yeah. the part selfish. that they refer to that is real is is really pretty boring. Like this morning, I was talking about forcing myself to go for a jog, even though my knees and my ankles yeah. are hurting, right? My instinct is to just not do that because the immediate gratification would be to stop the pain. But, you know, to my credit, I am able to think in the long term and, and force myself to go jogging because I know it's, it's doing me some good. Like that's not, that's not a profound observation. It shouldn't be to anyone. And it's not the basis for a soliloquy about religion and meaning and, and spirituality. And I guess what, what, what was he trying to say there? He was saying, okay, Jordan, you've talked about the temporal, we're, we're, just, we're just like mortal beings. He, he and, wants to say about, you know, like the given that the message of Christianity like resonates across time and all that. And there are mystical essences yeah. about, you know, the Trinity and all this. So I actually had a reading. It might be too flattering to, to, to Brand, but I took his meaning to mean, Hey, Jordan, you've been talking about essentially delayed gratification or like you said, um, cooperative behavior. Yeah. Where you, yeah. where you, um, but what about the ultimate sacrifice where you, where you do something that's clearly detrimental to you materially, like Jesus did, but it's for this greater good and whatever. How about that? And it's, he's kind of right in a way that doesn't, that doesn't fit, right? Jordan's, Jordan's attempt to relate these two things it actually oh doesn't. because you like reciprocal altruism right like eventually you you get you get paid back from yeah you, right well yeah so i have a clip that might speak to that let's see if the, the, what you interpret his point to be from this this is brandy and waffle um again it's kind of on the same point but uh, just listen when you were saying that of course when we default to making the self our deity uh, the sovereign being that which is currently charged whichever instinct is at the wheel whichever instinct is in the driving seat that will become the that will become sovereign at that moment if you have no recourse against that if you have no principle if you have no path if you have no Tao, if you have no christ if you have no way of breathing and living God into being, then you will default to the instincts in conjunction with cultural influence. That Those will be the two poles that will generate patterns as surely as if they were magnets on iron filings. And for there to be any charge at all, there must be polarity. This refusal of the call, the inability to accept maturation, the inability to throw off infancy and to accept accept the chalice, to accept the grail, to receive the wound, to know what you must do. This is, there is a tension in this for me in the maintenance of the necessary innocence that Christ himself insists we must find. And it seems that when you said for a moment, and I'd, I'd love your take on this as well as all everything that I'm saying, that, that the self is amorphous, the self is an event, it is not in stasis. The self will be discovered and will evolve in relationship. Then, indeed, we do lend some credence to those who say these two categories of maleness and femaleness, or man and woman, do not suit me. <laughs> 
Yeah, that took a turn at the end. He goes on and completely, he doesn't like really continue along that line, but like. Mm, that's, the, the, that's a nice, two- it's a nice example, Chris, of that scattergun, freeform jazz, bebopping thing. I mean, underneath all of that poetic bullshit, which I hate, was he saying that pretty old fashioned trope, which is that if you don't have like a higher power, like a religion to sort of guide you, then you know, you'll ultimately just be wallowing in your own desires and you'll corpulence. be ultimately corp- <laughs> yeah. Yeah, corpulence. Yeah. Um, but but also he, that thing about, you know, like Eric and whatever, they always have to reference like scientific, you know, like iron filings going around the poles, polarity, if you will. Like it's yeah, always the metaphor. this metaphorical <laughs> with yeah. science metaphors yeah. or quantum physics or you yeah. know literature yeah. it, like to make it yeah. a very yeah. indian point seem yeah. profound it's, right it, it's religion yeah it when you when you mush together religion and philosophy and science or all, all together then this is what you get yeah all right what a waste of time yeah they are like the sense makers though aren't they i mean they've got their own particularly lyrical way of doing it but it's very similar to the sense maker thing where they just keep elaborating and having ideas and incorporating those new ideas into what the other person just said and let's see if we can work with that and yeah what a waste of time yeah yeah (laughs) well so there's one final component of that matt because maybe you aren't being fair and they hadn't got to the final point so so let's see if Bran can crescendo like at the, at the end of that. Both you and I uh, tend to, as you laid out earlier in our conversation, move from the micro to the macro to march gladly out to the penumbra to see what might be found there. It leaves us with a kind of one, a duty to demonstrate in our conduct that, that quality of joy and open heartedness, that quality of good faith and, and And I feel that perhaps the next marker of our progression might be when we can say, well, what is it that is of value in these ideas that are emerging out of post-structuralism? The, uh, the sort of this willingness to cast out even nature. Even the body I'm born in isn't me. Nature itself isn't real. <laughs> to hell with the sun. To hell with Jesus. To hell even with my own chromosomes. Neither the cro- crucifix or the Y are of value in the final analysis. Um, and because I've lived there a while, because I've lived continually in indulgence, because I have been so many times humbled and my humbling continues yet, what it leaves me with is that there is something, obviously, obviously there is something in what you have brought into our culture that people were looking for and needed. And I, I value it and I appreciate it. That's why I apologize when I'm late, you know, tidy your room, man, to arrive on time, <laughs> stand up straight, you know, like, but there is also something that I am, <laughs> before I was an Ouroboros, consuming my own self and now I am more porous looking for ways to be open to solution and you know and I feel there is something we have to deliver he's such a pretentious prat isn't he god yeah that's that's a good summary he's a a massively pretentious asshole and and also just everything that he does is like self-indulgent like and and self-congratulatory and jordan peterson is bad but in a different way in some respects but but they are like varieties of narcissism right of narcissists like different ones and they do have similar things about like brand likes to get a bit more lyrical than jordan but jordan also can yeah. you know get yeah. very like ranty yeah. and banging his fist on the table so he just he just wouldn't say to hell with jesus and to hell with the sun and to hell with chromosomes right because that's just like brandian yeah not quite his style. But like, yeah new age waffle but yeah so that that thing and then also the the notion that they're humble <laughs> just just absolutely <laughs> No, no, you're yeah. not. <laughs> yeah. that but, humble. but you can also hear how Russell Brand is positioning himself as like he like he's having very performatively having that come to Jesus moment, you know, the road to Damascus moment. He was a sinner. Yeah. You know, he he's been down in the mud with the worst of them and, and he's he's got no pride left and now he's he's reinventing himself yet again. 
and what an exciting journey we can be a part of. There's one one other thing, Matt, from this conversation. Uh, you know, the we sometimes talk about the friction. Sometimes the gurus, even though that they are doing this like sense making jazz, like we saw in the sense making episode, there's a bit of friction. You know, the occasionally. They have to correct each other. And sometimes it's it's like, you know, Jordan Peterson would like it. it. It's lobsters establishing dominance hierarchies and whatnot. You have to be a bigger guru to correct another guru, right? Or at least you have to be somewhere on the, the same totem pole or whatever the metaphor is. But uh, so here's Brand like asking Jordan to take a pause when, when he's kind of complained about the sin of pride or something like that. So listen to this. I may say that when you reach immediately for pride as your example of hedonism, you do yourself no favors in my humble opinion, sir, because you could just as easily use an, an example of uh, hedonism and indulgence that doesn't have such overt and explicit connotations when it comes to a particular expression of human sexuality. That's just one point let me go on for ages if you don't mind um now i am aware of course of i've lived hedonistically i've been a drug addict i've lived indulgently for long periods of time so i understand the nature of that power and in practice how it may as well be a god and how you conceptualize that could be uh, pantheistically you could see it as uh, aphrodite or as venus you could see yourself as being devoured by cupid and certainly by by eros uh, uh, and making yourself the subject of such high humors priapus man priapus priapus indeed <laughs> indeed indeed but this is but i saw some things in what you were saying that struck me as important a lot of it is just brand you know on the one hand making a display of that he has been a sinner and you know that this leads him to understand things a bit better but he but he also does seem to take exception to like he's had that experience and therefore he knows better than anybody else that would want to comment on that kind of thing and i just it's narcissism and in the, in the same way there's a part where he talks about his wife and her like looking after the kids right and this is a reasonable thing to note that your you know your wife or your partner is doing a whole bunch of stuff and sacrificing but like the way Brand explains it, let, let's just hear it. I love it. I love that. Often in my wife, she we have a young son, as you know, and I see flashes of the archetype. I see how she is governed by what I suppose Richard Dawkins would call uh, um, uh, natural processes. But I see beyond that, I see the light that shines. I see behind the behavior, behind the biology. I feel the resonance that she is redolent with the spirit of the ancestors that she is not just their mother but she is the mother how could any woman sacrifice so much how could any woman continue to provide so unquestioningly and so uh, diligently i'm struck by several things it's plain that there is a negotiation and it seems to me that what you're saying is that the error of this new progressive postmodern uh, sort of marxist to use your sort of uh, uh, you, you, the, the language that you would use even if I would sort of query that language uh, um, there is a negotiation and that negotiation of course must involve power I'm struck that what Moses, what Moses carries out politically against a, a sort of a, a, a another king, an alternative king in the Pharaoh, uh, a, a, and as the head of a tribe, Christ carries out as an emissary alone and in the desert there are parallels the desert is a parallel the adversarial nature of the sort of combat there is a parallel there okay okay so <laughs> the so, desert is a parallel that that's important his wife uh, is not just a muller d muller the um, mother uh, yeah i mean there's such a strong segue there in the middle it distracted me like you, you went from talking about his domestic situation, situation and, someone and in the like, desert but I mean, yeah, this is a good example of what you said, Chris, earlier on about how they, they take something that is, they take something and they turn it into this grand universal thing. So so the, the story is a little bit suspect anyway. Okay, his, his wife 
apparently does most of the work looking after the kids. But yeah, it might I think be... she's talked about that in some other content <laughs> or he has as well. So <laughs> I yeah, see. all right. It could be a, it could be the result of power dynamics. We don't know. Might be the result of um, evolved um, preferences. Um, we don't know, but the main thing or is this, that the spiritual redolent Muller exactly. shining the, through. Right. Yeah, more importantly, she she is epitomizing the perfect archetype of the spiritual mother and so on. And there's so many things you can say about it, but it's just so pretentious and it's spinning up such a grand thing out of out of whatever. Anyway, and then the segue to gods dueling in the desert or something. I don't know. I lost the thread there. What did yeah, that they have la- to do with the other thing? <laughs> I don't know. Well, it could, you know, it could even relate to what we were just talking about, setting up other things as gods and the, like, religion actually being political in a way and, you know, all, all this stuff. But who cares, Matt? Who cares? Like, it's just <laughs> everything in their life has to be hugely symbolically dense and important it's not enough that for the way that russell brand talks about it his his wife is an avatar of the of the divine like even if it means that he's not doing as much of the kid duties or whatever the important thing is the symbolic role that she plays in his complex interpretive castle and and then the nature of religion isn't the parallel of a desert like they've talked about sacrifice they talked about silhouettes in the desert there's silhouette you know like it's just all just pick a word just pick a concept and you know riff off on it and Mm. this is a style of discussion that is really popular in a whole bunch of different fields it's not just it it is very popular in the guru sphere is popular in the sense making sphere but but this is a style of reasoning, which a lot of people like, and I fucking hate it because it just, <laughs> it's, it sounds so grand, but it's ultimately so empty or, or if it is dense, it's dense with a, a lot of like, a lot yeah. of interpretive work that relies on these assumptions that you have to accept. Like yeah. there is this deep a mystical nature mm. to the universe, which is communicated view through the Bible and all this kind of stuff. And the thing, the, yeah. the thing that I hate about it, yeah, is I had all those things you said. And in addition, the speaking in such an obscure... Obscurantism. Yeah. Yeah. Is like a feature. Like that's that. It is know. a feature. Yeah. yeah. If you yeah. get the appointed takes you like eight minutes of soliloquies about the desert and the grandmother and the, you know, that's the way it is. And, and just to say, Matt, we might seem like we, you know, didn't enjoy this, but Jordan is certainly mesmerized. So let me ask you, let me ask you that specifically, like you're quite the wizard of words now. And, and so you have that as a gift. Now you You've detailed out your subjugation to the to the land of whim, let's say. And now you're you have this podcast, you have a public presence. You've been vouchsafed that This is your podcast. I mean your podcast <laughs> right now. This is your podcast. So now, man, now yeah, we're well, getting somewhere. The- when it becomes an absolute amorphous podcast where the father and son don't even know because the spirit is so abundant and all immersive that we don't even know who's Moses, who's the Pharaoh, who's Jesus, who's the serpent. Now we're getting somewhere, baby. Well, so it seems to me, well, it seems to me the, the, uh, it's all of our podcasts. Russell. A couple of little things. I mean, first, like, you can't just say because you're an, you, you, you can speak to this because you're an addict. Can't say that. He's got to say, no, you were, you were subjugated to the land of whimsy. <laughs> like, <laughs> what, do you have to, that's just what, that's, that's a small, that's a minor point, but uh, copped up so many times here. But don't you feel, Chris, that Brand is so obviously just pretending, right? Like, he's so obviously just, okay, this is my, this is my role now. I'm a I'm a sense maker, theologian, philosopher, a prophet person with with Jordan yeah. Peterson, and he plays along and he takes it. Ser- he seems as if he's taking it seriously some of the time, but at other times, he he doesn't. And that was a good example there, where he's he just starts talking shit and shit talking about the nonsense that they're doing, and it, it seems to me he sometimes lets the mask slip a little bit. You could read it like that, but I think that's just the way he always is like in these you know he likes to be called flippant or whatever and kind of present like he's you know like a jester right the kind of revealing the 
deep, profound truths, but at the same time, he's an everyman, right? And and all this. Yeah. And I just like, yeah. Duh. But despite the fact that they are treating soliloquies, like they obviously enjoy each other's company and verbal fluency. This is in, you know, two people that have maxed out speaking in grandiose terms, colliding in the night. And yes, they do mostly just want to talk about what they want to say, but they, they do enjoy being in the presence. It's like being, yeah. you know, with somebody else that's a master of mm. some craft that you have as well. And uh, Yeah, yeah. I mean, we saw yeah. that with the sense makers. Like the sense makers are totally, they not only talk bullshit themselves, they're extremely receptive to bullshit that's being spoken by other people right and i think it goes to what you're saying which is some people really get off on this stuff and it's it's maybe got to do with a just a way of thinking like this is how they think you know they started off with talking about you know the semantic networks and and traversing the these networks of association and i think it it makes sense that that rings true for them because that's kind of what they do right they're like little spiders running around the semantic web yeah, yeah. they find it enjoyable they find it meaningful they feel like they're doing something useful 